and we're now at the top of the hour. All right. So thank you those for going ahead and saying hello in the chat box. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. What gets measured gets done. Exploring ATE evaluators and principal investigators attention to diversity, equity, and inclusion. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate advances evaluation in the ATE community and beyond by offering trainings, cultivating a network, researching emerging topics, and collecting data, data about the ATE program. All of that Evaluate materials are open source, so be sure to check out Evaluate's website to learn more. The slides from this webinar are already on Evaluate's website, along with a handout. You may also download these resources by following the link on the right side of your screen, which Anna can provide to you in the chat box. This recording will be available within a couple of days and will be emailed to you. I'm Emma Lieberg. I will be a moderator for today's webinar. Dr. Aisha Boyce from Arizona State University and co-principal investigator of Evaluate and leading our study on equity, diversity, and inclusion will be joining us along with Dr. Tiffany Green, sorry, Tiffany Smith from University of North Carolina Greensboro, and she is also a member of Evaluate's EDI research team. They will be our today's presenters. We'd also like to put out a special thank you to our community members, Yi Zhang Wang, Adam McKee, and Kandaya Mann from Washington State University, who provided valuable feedback on this webinar, and Evaluate's editor, Carolyn, Carolyn williams Noren. Additionally, we would like to thank our Evaluate team for, who worked behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today. Evaluate is funded Sorry about that. Evaluate is funded by the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program, or ATE for short. The ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. This is a good time to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. And now I will turn things over to Aisha. <clears throat> we are excited to spend the next hour with you. And in terms of our outline, we'll begin with some introductions. Thanks to those who have already kind of kicked us off in the chat. We're going to ask you another few questions again. So uh, if, you are, if you've already put uh, your name and your location in, we're going to ask you again because we're going to ask your institution as well. Um, then Dr. Smith is going to talk a little bit about the creation of a reflective space. Our goal throughout the next hour is to be a bit interactive. So we have built-in polls and built-in sessions. Can everyone hear me? Uh-oh. Oh, no one can hear me. Uh, it says I'm unmuted. So your audio is fine. Most of us can hear you. It sounds like some of us <laughs> must just be having audio connections. So okay. go ahead and continue. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Great. Um, and then a lot of our work um, that we're going to talk about today in terms of the practical aspects of uh, measuring and defining diversity, equity, inclusion is really based in some empirical work that we've done. So we'll talk a little bit about that and then we'll kind of wrap up with some final reflections. Let's see. <clears throat> So I would just like to begin with a few introductions. Um, as uh, Emma mentioned, my name is Aisha Boyce, and I have just transitioned from University of North Carolina at Greensboro over to an assistant, or an, excuse me, an associate professor position at Arizona State University. And I co-lead the STEM program evaluation lab, along with Dr. Aileen Reed and Dr. Tiffany Smith. And I just wanted to highlight, this is, uh, you know, everything virtual right now. And so this is a picture of the lab group that we work with. And a special shout out to J.R. Moeller, Tyler Clark, Andrea Smith, Onyenye Chukwu Onwuka, um, as they all work on um, this project with us. Make sure I didn't miss anybody. J.R., Tyler, Onyenye, and Andrea. That's right. So now we'd like to do a quick 
round of introductions with you all in the chat. And oh, I'm going to give a quick introduction of myself, actually. So I just said that's that's what I who I am. Um, I have my research interest and expertise is in culture responsive STEM program evaluation and teaching evaluation. I just moved to Arizona literally uh, less than a week ago, and I'm due with my second baby, uh, a little girl in August. So a little fun fact. Let's see if I think Tiffany can hear. So Tiffany, if you don't, if you want to jump in and introduce yourself. So good afternoon, of, guys. Good my name's Tiffany Smith. I was just having some technical difficulties, so I'm, I jumped in right at the right time here. Um, I am a clinical assistant professor here at UNCG, the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, I consider my academic identity an evaluation scholar, practitioner, and teacher. Um, my research interests are in reflective practice, interpersonal skills, and teaching evaluation. And a fun fact is I just got married this month. Um, and so that's very exciting. Welcome, everybody. Good news all around on our end. So we would love it if you all would take a quick second to add your location, your institution, and your position. Thanks so much to those who are already engaging in the chat. We see those congrats coming in. We see everyone kind of talking about where they're from, but would love to see your institution and position as well. So if you have a second, please go ahead and type those answers in the chat box and we'll monitor those as they're coming in. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tiffany. It is great to see such a diverse group of people coming from all over the place. We were so surprised to see such a, such a wide variety of humans joining us today. Um, I want to start by grounding us in this time. Um, we've been in a time of societal turbulence, and many of us are widening our eyes to the injustices that have occurred in the world and in our country, in the United States in particular. Um, so I want to ground us here and uh, particularly in the importance of being reflective in our practice. Uh, John Dewey says that reflective thinking is always more or less troublesome because it involves overcoming the inertia that inclines one to accept suggestions at their face value. It involves willingness to endure a condition of mental unrest and disturbance, judgment suspending, suspended during further inquiry, to maintain the state of doubt and to carry on systematic and protracted inquiry. These are the essentials of thinking. And so I really do want to um, take the time to create a reflective space with you all today. Um, and in particular, I want us to think about some um, overarching value rational questions as Feiberg talks about them. So Feiberg's uh, Making Social Science Matter book um, articulates these value rational questions. I want us to keep these in, in our minds as we go through today's conversation. So first of all, what is happening in our practice? Where are we headed and why? Second, what's going well and what's not going so well in our practice? What could be improved as we move forward or modified in our practice? And who gains and who loses and by which mechanisms of power? So as evaluators, when we think about this reflective space, we should be thinking, what is our responsibility, right? How can we further facilitate the assessment of success and value of programs through our efforts? So um, reflective practice, uh, just to define it for us, is an iterative process of thinking and questioning, self and contextual awareness focused on learning and improvement for both the evaluator and those involved in the evaluation. So I'd like to think about um, this webinar as an opportunity to further incorporate ourselves into the mirror of our evaluative practice by really, really honing in on this reflective space. So reflective practice can be done both alone and with other people. And so I want to think about this as a collaborative space, that collaborative reflective space that we are, um, we're engaged in here together. So that means that reflective practice requires our active listening, uh, listening to us in the space, but also when we think about going back to our own practice, uh, to our clients and to our colleagues as well. It also requires evaluative and critical thinking, not taking things at face value, assessing what's happening and its goodness and its badness. Reflective practice also requires authentic, 
communication, right? So that we're conveying our thoughts appropriately. And we could even be thinking about communication with ourselves in that space. Reflective practice also requires that we are being intentional in our actions. We do reflective practice for a purpose, right? It's not a willy-nilly sort of situation. Um, it also requires us being aware of ourselves as well as the context that we're operating in. This means that we really need to be able to articulate our own positionality and values and the positionality and values of those that we're interacting with. In order for it to really be reflective practice, um, you have to take action, right? There has to be an interest in taking action on our reflective practice process. What will we do as a result of our reflection time and what will we learn and how will we apply it? Finally, uh, that takes a mindset toward change and a willingness to grow as a result of our reflections. Um, a passionate humility, as Yanao 2009 puts it. So in your reflections today, as we go through this process, I want you to think about who are you as an evaluator and how do you incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion into your evaluation efforts? What does your practice look like? How are people's voices incorporated? What's going well in your practice around DEI? What could be going better? Within your context and within the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion, who gains and who loses and by which mechanisms of power? What do diversity, equity, and inclusion look like and how could they be further envisioned in your own evaluation projects? And finally, what can you do and what can be done to improve your evaluation practice moving forward? So uh, it's really important to note that this, this work is iterative by its very nature, right? Reflective practice is an iterative and constant process. So too uh, is the practice of passionate humility and cultural responsiveness. So a bonus question for you as we go through this is how will you incorporate deliberate intentional reflection in your practice and the practices of the programs that you evaluate? Specifically with regard to DEI, oop, there we go. What data sources can provide evidence about an, and increase the richness of your practices related to diversity, equity, and inclusion issues? And as evaluators, how can we capture both process and product? So uh, really interested in taking a time to pause uh, briefly and uh, see if there are any questions uh, from our audience. I just put a call out for people. Uh, we haven't gotten any questions come through yet that I've seen, but I do want to give people a, a quiet moment to give them an opportunity to possibly write some questions if they have them. Uh, folks, if you have any questions over uh, what Tiffany just went over, um, yes, Alyssa just asked the question. So I will go ahead and pop this up for everyone because I'm sure uh, more people will have this question while we'll be sharing the slides. So the slides are actually all posted on Evaluate's website already. Um, we will also have an additional handout as well. So that is a great question, and those will be available along with the recording of this webinar as well. The recording normally goes up in two to three days after the webinar. Thank you for asking that, Alyssa. And does anyone else have any other questions for uh, Tiffany regarding reflective practice or anything else? I just want to make sure I didn't miss any in the chat. We were moving quite quick. All right, we just got a few questions coming in, so I'll go ahead and pop these up for you guys. Um, so here is one. Reflection is incredibly important, but it can sometimes get pushed aside due to so many, many of the day-to-day -day demands of our work. How do you make time for this? What a great question. Um, I think that there are multiple ways um, that you can reflect on your practice, right? So um, I intuitively uh, think about a number of different things I do as reflective practice processes. So things as simple as uh, scheduling a one hour long meeting with Aisha so that we can uh, make sure that we talk about uh, how to improve our practices uh, moving forward. Uh, things like um, taking space within 
evaluation team meetings to ask those critical questions. What's going well with our evaluation project? What's not going so well? What could be doing? What could we be doing differently? Those sorts of things, right? Um, Ayesha, what do you think? Do you have any thoughts here? Yeah, I completely agree. I think it has to be intentional, right? I think the only way that you make time for it is to formally make time for it. So, uh, but I think that's a great question. We're all incredibly busy, but um, as Tiffany said, we have kind of like weekly meetings for an hour. And part of the point of those meetings is to reflect. Um, it looks like, uh, let's see. We also had another question. Um, oh, okay, from Janet saying, can you give insights into how you engage your clients in the reflective practice you've just explained? Tiffany, do you wanna start off there? Sure, um, I have only recently become a little bit more um, intentional um, about using reflective practice as a method for um, collecting data. Uh, around people's thoughts about how things are going in their practice. Um, so that is one way to do it. Uh, frame it as a reflective practice process. Uh, tell them that that's what you want to engage uh, in. Um, and I have recently used uh, the data model for reflective practice, which is um, uh, a model for reflection uh, that was published for uh, adult learning um, originally and for action research purposes. And um, I moved it into the evaluation space in 2015. So the data model is a describe, analyze, theorize, act. Um, and so in the describe section of the data model, um, we're interested in really just understanding what's going on, right? Um, how, what, what is happening in the program that we're evaluating? Um, and then when we go into the analysis phase, we start to ask questions like, what's going well? What's not going well, right? What could be, what could be done differently um, on the basis of how things are going? Um, and so then we move into theorize. And when we think about theorize, um, we're thinking about something a little bit more like practical theorizing, um, thinking about brainstorming how we could how we could potentially act moving forward um, on the basis of what we know is going well and what's not going well. Um, and uh, really trying to make a, a plan for action, right? So that last letter in the data model is action. So what are, what are the actions, the action steps that our um, clients can take on the basis of their collaborative reflection, right? Um, so that's one way to do it. I think that it's really, I, honestly, I think naming it is really important um, and being able to um, really lean on the fact that as evaluators, we are doing reflective practice at all times. Um, evaluation is a reflective practice, um, right? Uh, so yeah, we will definitely, um, we'll link to the data model in the chat. There were a lot of questions. I don't know which one I should answer next. I think we should probably maybe hold, hang on to some of them so we can keep going, um, but maybe circle back if we don't get to everything, if we have time at the end. Sure, that sounds perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much for everyone's engagement and questions. I love this. Um, and I, someone asked a question about indicators, which we're gonna talk more about. So if we don't answer all of those questions as we're um, kind of talking through this, then we will definitely um, circle back around to that. <clears throat> and uh, Lissa just put the link to the data model in the chat. So thanks so much, Lissa. Okay, so now we're going to spend a little bit of time um, defining diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, we're gonna begin by asking you all some of your thoughts about diversity, equity, and inclusion before we get into our own empirical work and talking about how to um, measure and um, look for, uh, measure and collect data on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So just in the chat, just take a second. Um, what are your thoughts about, what comes to mind when you think about diversity? When you think about the term diversity, what comes to mind? Whether it's a perspective as an evaluator, we also have some grants administrators here and some program managers. Would love to just see in the chat, what comes to your mind when you think about diversity? Yeah, thanks so much, Rachel. Yep, I see lots of answers coming in. Oh, okay. Yeah, some of these are really great. Strength. 
Mm -hmm. I, that one stood out to me as well. So keep them coming. Um, now I'm going to ask you what comes to mind when you think about equity, right? Equity. What comes to mind when you think about equity? Fairness, distributed power, justice, fairness, yeah. Great answers. Leveling playing field. Yeah, really, really great answers. Mm -hmm. Does it truly exist? Oh, great, great comment. And finally, keep those, keep those ideas coming, but what comes to mind when you think about inclusion? Yeah, M uh, Minda, that is a really, really, really great comment. Minda said that a lot of people um, conflate the terms uh, equity and equality, and I completely agree, and that's also what some of our work has found. Yeah, so inclusion, belonging, everyone has a voice, creating a space, excellent. We really, really appreciate everyone engaging with us in the chat. So now we're gonna just talk a little bit about how we have defined and how others have defined diversity, equity, and inclusion. So yeah, it's our and sense so that um, when we how we have defined diversity for the purposes of our work um, is a variety and traditional socio demographic markers such as class, gender, and race, as well as other ways people are different from one another. And we can also look to the National Academy of Science uh, for a definition as well. And we have used that for our work. And the definition for NAS is differences among individuals, including demographic differences such as gender, race, ethnicity, and country of origin. When we define equity for this work, uh, we think about parity in program access, participation and accomplishments for all program participants, especially those least well served in context. If we look at the NAS definition, you might see a slight variation here um, on how, how we define it, right? So fair distribution of opportunities to participate and succeed in education for all students. And then finally, we have inclusion. Uh, fostering an environment in which participants are, are and feel embraced, included, and valued. And the NAS says processes through which all students are made to feel welcome and are treated as motivated learners. The world is becoming increasingly small and the need to communicate and serve diverse contexts and communities is growing larger. I think we would can also argue that the need has been there, but um, maybe it's not the need is growing larger, but there's more attention to this important need, right? And we love the comments that are coming in the chat. Feel free to keep commenting. So just a little bit of background and context about our work, right? So historically, minoritized groups in the United States have, have had a much smaller presence in STEM professional fields than their peers. Evidence suggests that STEM fields have been riddled with biases and a culture of exclusion and limited accessibility persists. Much of this you all probably already know. That being said, policymakers, industry leaders, and scholars have pushed to improve STEM education and grow the number of diverse students interested in STEM and STEM careers, also known as broadening participation. And the National Science Foundation, let's try to get this going. Mm -hmm. The National Science Foundation has made commitments to broadening participation. And one example, of this is the Advanced Technological Education Program. The, it encourages faculty at two-year colleges to serve as principal investigators on ATE projects, which aim to attract a more diverse student population to STEM. And our work specifically, we've sought to better understand the extent to which STEM educational programming, especially in the ATE program, 
provides a pathway to STEM for underrepresented minorities. Um, and so the National Academies of Sciences, NAS 2018, and I'm sure we can probably find a link to that report, um, has said that it calls on the nation to strive for equity, diversity, and inclusion of STEM students and instructors by providing equitable opportunities for access and success. And within that NAS 2018 document, they do have a list of indicators. And so our study has built on developments in culture responsive evaluation to really investigate how these practices are being and can be applied within the ATE context. And so our empirical work, which is much of, thank you so much, Lissa, the, the link to the report is in the chat, um, really has two, um, we're currently investigating two questions right now. The first is how are ATE external evaluators and principal investigators defining and measuring diversity, equity, inclusion in their project and evaluation practices? And to what extent do these definitions align with NAS definitions? And to what extent does their work and the data that they collect align with how NAS defines DEI? And so we've been um, doing this work for just over three years now. And our data collection began in 2019. In January of 2019, we sent out questions on the Evaluate um, Principal Investigator Survey. We also had questions on an evaluator survey in 2019. Then in 2020, we added questions to an evaluator survey. And then we've also done roughly 20 interviews with PIs and evaluators. So in terms of our data analysis, we've done some quantitative survey data analysis, mostly using descriptive statistics. We've done qualitative survey analysis using Atlas TI. And we've also begun to do inductive thematic analysis of the interviews. And I do want to mention that if you um, check back with the Evaluate website in about a week, um, the reports, uh, which include our findings from these data, will be up. We're kind of wrapping up copy editing of those reports, and we also have a manuscript under review right now. And so what we are going to do is, for the rest of our time together, is we're going to um, provide an overview of some of the research findings and then provide pr practical examples of our thoughts of how um, you all might engage with these topics. All right, so I want y'all to jump in with us for a second, um, and we're gonna make this part of the uh, conversation a little bit interactive, um, and we're gonna uh, go ahead and do a poll question. So let's go ahead and get that poll question going. Um, and so what I want us to do is take a look at the following three quotes. And I want you to select option A, B, or C, which of the following demonstrates a good way to examine and measure diversity. So A, notes regarding the composition of groups of students in interviewed about their experience of the advanced technology. B, this is the focus of the blank university. So the ATE classes were designed to be a general education course that would be available to the entire campus. Or C, demographic data on student and faculty participants in ATE activities. And I want us to, to just note that these are real quotes from evaluators from uh, the Evaluate group. So I think we're seeing some overwhelming support, um, perhaps for response C uh, being perhaps the yes answer. Um, and as it aligns with our qualitative, uh, our qualitative theming for our project, uh, you guys basically have the exact same sort of alignment with us. So the response C um, is very much a, um, it shows that we're looking at the diversity of people that are attending, right? But that response A, uh, that was counted as a maybe in our data um, because we maybe that's a, in alignment, but we're not quite sure, right? And then B uh, doesn't seem to really be getting at diversity, right? All right, so in terms of some of our findings, um, what we have found is that um, most participants 
um, of the evaluator survey um, reported that they collect data on diversity as a part of their ATE project. Uh, of those participants who noted that they collected on data on diversity, they overwhelmingly reported that they collect demographic information to address the topic. And interestingly, participants sometimes explain specific project activities um, as they were associated with the, the collection of de uh, diversity data, the most common one being specific enrollment activities. Didn't put that pie chart up, apologies guys. Um, and if we want to take a look at uh, the Likert data for this analysis, um, when we see the diversity findings, we see that 4.4% shared that they did not gather evidence related to diversity. 95.6% did, um, and 60% of the participants shared that they gather evidence on diversity to a substantial or a very substantial extent. I think across diversity, okay. equity, inclusion, so, um, what we found and, and what you all might have experienced is that diversity is really one of the easiest and most straightforward of these constructs to measure. And here are a couple of our thoughts about um, based on our findings and based on our own current practical work about example evaluation questions that you might utilize. How and in what ways is project leadership attending to diversity? What barriers? Um, and opportunities exist, how might progress toward diversity be included, right? I think it's really important that we ask formal evaluation questions to get at diversity, equity, and inclusion. To what extent has a project increased diversity of participants? Of course, most projects have diversity goals, so you could ask more specific targeted goals to the project. Some example indicators for diversity, um, looking at the diversity of leadership or the representation of those in the program or project, um, calculating initial underrepresented minority numbers and percentages, tracking change in underrepresented minority um, participation, looking at the total number of participants, looking at retention rates and disaggregating them by various demographics, looking at the comparing national demographics and representation of participants. So one of the key indicators for diversity is demographics. So what are some examples of demographics that should be or can be looked at? Um, we have various LGBTQA identities. needs, racial and ethnic groups, identities, religious groups, learning and mental accessibility needs, gender identity, age, nationality, school attended or not or no schooling, countries lived in or social economic status. These are just a few examples that we're sharing with you, but there are definitely others that can be thought about. And so some ways to collect data around diversity, surveys, of course, right? Focus groups and interviews can help get at some of the more nuances of diversity, especially looking at different intersectional, intersectional identities. Um, when available, institutional and administrative data, and of course, any program or project documentation. Now we're going to jump in and we're going to do another poll uh, just to just to keep up the the, um, the traction here with you guys. So I'm going to share uh, three quotes again with you and I want you to tell me um, for each of them or um, for uh, all three of them, which one counts as the one that seems to be the most aligned with equity. So is it option A? all materials that relate to the program are vetted by the College for Equity? Is it B, expansion of the program to underserved populations, specifically females and people of color in STEM? Or is it C, increasing participation of autistic students in STEM ATE programs?
Seeing a little bit more of a variety in responses right now. All right, give us some time to try to work it out and see what we're feeling. Okay, so movement in the pole has stopped uh, practically. Um, I'm, I, I feel like this is very interesting data it, it, and it really, really relates to whether we know the definition of equity and how it can be measured, right? So um, we, we seem to have priority for the, the option B, which is expansion of program to underserved populations, uh, specifically females and people of color in STEM. That was, um, on our maybe list. Um, and um, Aisha, what are your thoughts? Uh, do you have any? Um... Well, I think the interesting thing is we, especially what we're specifically were looking at with this study was the extent to which um, the answers align with the way NAS defines equity. And you'll also see inclusivity um, next as well. And so um, just as those in the polls have kind of indicated, we also struggled um, to say to what extent, and I think you'll show the slide next, but to what extent, um, you know, these were really, really well aligned. And, and, and we realized that for some of these, we didn't have enough information when we asked, like, how do you measure it? Well, if you've said, well, how do you measure it? As if we asked evaluators, how do you measure equity? And then they answered, well, all the materials are vetted by the college for equity. Well, that's not really how you're measuring it, right? Like maybe the programmatically, that's how the program is aiming to um, engage with, with, mm -hmm. with uh, equity, but that's not really how, as an evaluator, how we measure it. So to me, A is, is very easily, we can see that that's a no, but when we look at B and C, there is, um, you know, depending upon how we have interpreted and how others interpret it, there is like those are maybes or yeses. And so I think that was one of the things that we struggle with ourselves as the research team. When you only have a small comments box uh, and uh, maybe one or two sentences to uh, judge, it's harder, right? And that's why we're doing interviews and, and, and doing analysis of those. But I think that Aisha, your point about A is really, really important. Um, what is the, what's in there so, that's actually a measure? There's nothing in there, right? That tells us uh, what's going on. Uh, and that makes it problematic from an evaluation perspective. So, uh, According to our data, um, we found that 83.7% um, of our participants, our evaluation or evaluator participants, uh, noted that they collected data on equity in their evaluation of their ATE project. Um, and so, oh, my slides are a little bit different. Um, and so as, as related to diversity, um, when you take a look at both of these Likert type responses together, um, equity, 16.4% of participants shared that they did not gather evidence uh, related to equity. And only, I say only, but this is actually kind of impressive, 31.4% shared that they gather evidence on, diversity, on equity to a substantial or a very substantial extent. So how did they say um, that they measured equity? Well, the most frequent types of data collected regarding equity were program documentation, surveys, demographic information, and interviews and focus groups. Specific project activities that were associated when, when participants provided responses to this question uh, were recruitment, marketing and outreach, and participants sometimes mentioned uh, a particular population served in the equity open-ended responses. All right, and so final poll question of the day. Practical uh, advice that we're um, given. Um, again, I think equity is one of the more difficult constructs to um, engage with as an evaluator and, and oftentimes as as a program or grants administrator. But here are some example evaluation questions about our thoughts 
about ways that you can formally and explicitly um, seek to measure equity. So one, how and in what ways are project leadership attending to equity? That's easy, right? What is the quality of the program design, content, and pedagogy as designed for various and diverse learners in this context? To what extent is the project differentiating instruction based on need? How and in what ways is the project ensuring that various populations have access to resources? Are key project components operating effectively? What is working well and for whom? And one of the things that whenever we, we talk to evaluators about measuring DEI, we are often asked, well, how do I make sure that I'm looking at this? How do I make sure that I'm shining the spotlight um, and not just looking at diversity, right? Which is a little bit easier. And again, th the way to do that is, is by adding equity and inclusivity and diversity specific questions. And of course, there are some outcome questions that can be useful and impact questions that can be useful when examining equity and diversity and inclusion, but there's also some formative questions, right? That can really help um, the project think well about, especially to, if, if it's iterative or a multi-year project. And so lots of indicators to examine equity, right? Looking at um, external factors or threats and, and how they may differ across various groups looking at supports that are in place or access for a variety of groups, looking at the diversification of services, depending upon need or depending upon population, looking at the trainings that have been offered and taking, taken by um, programmatic or project staff, looking to see if there's differences in compensation, right? Who gets paid what? Or who gets recognized for what as well, I would say. Um, criteria for selection, this is a huge one. Um, recruitment versus selection rates. Retention, and of course you wanna look at this disaggregated. Uh, disciplinary actions taking across um, various groups, right? And then looking specifically at curriculum and its di differentiation for various populations. And again, I mean, these, what we're talking right now are kind of broad indicators, but there are definitely more specific indicators that you can think about and, and you can assign metrics, turning these indicators into metrics, assigning them specifically for your own project. So a few more, GPA, um, mentoring, an amount and type, who gets it? Of course, looking at satisfaction, again, disaggregating that data, looking at percent of resources based on need and attendance to see if there's any differences across various groups. And so again, when we're thinking about recruitment, and really for all of these, right, all of these example indicators on this slide, again, we wanna look at the way that we can look at equity, right, is look, to look for a differentiation, to look if there's differences in different groups that can't be explained away just by, you know, um, random chance. And so, when we're looking at equity, again, some ways to look at this are similar to the ways that we um, collect data around diversity, surveys, interviews, focus groups, um, institutional or in administrative data, program documentation, but also observational data can help us see like what's happening and what's going on um, within the project. My only thought is just again, to um, in terms of uh, choosing option A, B, or C. Um, I'm going to share three additional quotes from our evaluation um, ATE folks um, in the survey, and I want y'all to uh, tell me which one seems the most aligned in terms of a way to measure inclusion. So is it option A, questions relating to actions and outcomes related to making more people feel included? particularly by knowing what options are available to them and being able to see themselves in the roles they are learning about. Is it B, survey responses related to a sense of belonging in program settings? Or is it C, uh, we really aren't collecting much other than demographic data?
what are we thinking? What do we think? Which response is the right response or the most accurately measuring? We've got our, uh, most of our responses are uh, leaning towards response A. Uh, we got some responses uh, that say that response B is right, but um, obviously we're seeing a 0% um, response uh, to C being the right response, and I appreciate that, right? If you just collect demographics, you're not getting to inclusion. A and B definitely show us that there is some, some sense of inclusion um, being measured um, in, in the particular questions um, that are being asked. Ayesha, do you have any thoughts here? To, to comment that um, for A and B, for A, I, be, I believe we put yes, and for B, I believe we put maybe. And I think, again, for A, it's very clear. Here's how you're measuring it. It's clear that you have a good understanding, whoever the people are who filled out the survey, um, that, you, uh, that you have a very clear understanding. And B is like, yeah, that's you're, you're probably uh, measuring um, inclusion, you're probably thinking thinking about ways in which to better understand this. But um, you know, is it that you're just um, looking at this deeply, or you're kind of just getting surface? And so, again, when you hopefully you all will have opportunity to read our report. But we did struggle with yes, this is definitively 100% shadow of a doubt um, uh, aligning with the NAS definition of, of inclusion and and. We had lots of maybes, like, well, maybe with a little bit more information, uh, we could have uh, for sure said yes. But again, that is why we did, we've did. we done follow-up uh, interviews. And I will say that our interview data is really proving, we thought it would be very clear, um, but it's proving that, it, that you know, there is a difference um, in understanding and, and opinions of, of how you go about measuring these constructs. And so what we thought was in the, in the um, interviews, it would be very clear cut, but actually our, from initial findings, it's not as clear cut. So I think those is, is going to prove to be really interesting as well. All right, so, how so let's to measure move inclusion. forward with these uh, Some with these sample evaluation questions. Oh, my slides are a little bit funky. I just wanna see where I am real quick. So I'm gonna start here. Um, and so in terms of our research findings, uh, like I said, or like you've seen for the other ones, we, we measured, um, in a Likert type way, um, whether they collected data on inclusion in their evaluation of their ATE projects. Um, and 85.4% uh, shared that they do so. Um, and if we take a look, just because that slide's right here, um, if we take a look at all of the Likert responses together, uh, we see that um, with inclusion, we've got 14.7% um, of people who um, said that they don't include, they don't collect data at all. Um, and then we have, uh, interestingly, 36.8% of participants shared that they gather evidence on um, inclusion to a substantial or a very substantial extent. So um, in terms of how they uh, collect data, the most frequent types of data collected regarding equity were program documentation, surveys, demographic information, um, and interviews and focus groups. Participants again decided to uh, specific, focus on specific project activities that were evaluated um, during um, the evaluation of inclusion, and that included recruitment, marketing and outreach, and participants actually sometimes mentioned a particular population served um, during their responses. Um, tech difficulties right again how specifically just asking how our project leadership attending to inclusion and cultural issues looking at the project culture and climate looking at what participants experiences are and and how they experience sense of belonging and then again of course always making sure to look at differences across different uh, types of groups some sample indicators that can ultimately be turned into metrics looking at support that are in place or access, 
looking at curriculum and making sure it's um, uh, accessible and that there's representation for multiple participants who are there that they can see themselves in the curriculum, I think is key. Um, looking at leadership and their, act and, and their efforts for inclusivity, looking at program training for those who are running the program, looking at project goals. Is this explicitly a goal for the project to, to be inclusive, to provide a space for different types of participants? looking at the extent to which um, stakeholders' voices are included and that those who participate participating can be authentic. Of course, looking at climate satisfaction, and again, looking at attendance, breaking that out across groups and looking at participant experience. So again, when you're looking at climate, there's lots of um, various uh, uh, components or constructs that, that make up climate. Some of these can be sense of belonging, understanding of role and responsibility, and again, looking if there's differences across groups, um, issues of self-efficacy, relationship with leadership, looking for differences, and identity in STEM or whatever um, context your project is situated in. Again, the same uh, example data collection methods to be utilized as equity, so I won't go over that again. So just your own thoughts, having gone through this as we're wrapping up, in your own context, what do you think will be the most difficult to measure? And you can answer in the poll here. In your own context, what do you think is the most difficult to measure? Okay, a lot of people saying equity, I agree. But would love to see a few more people, a few additional thoughts, so we'll give it a second. with this poll. Aww. Okay, well, um, let's move over to the chat. So why did you choose that? And, and if you didn't get to answer the poll, please feel free to put in chat. What is it about equity that you think will make it difficult to answer, excuse me, difficult to measure um, in your own context? Yeah, without strong and agreed upon metrics, it can be subjective. I agree. Yeah, that is a great, great answer, Seth. Yeah, I think we we almost need to like have a whole conversation of this idea of subjectivity. Um, I think what a lot of people are probably ultimately talking about is has to do with epistemology. Um, everyone don't go to sleep, but um, what we view as actually counts as, as real good data and really understanding if, if there's agreement that there are multiple kind of lived experiences, which would not necessarily mean that it's subjective. It would just mean that different people are having different experiences. So um, I think this is ultimately really, really could, you know, maybe we can follow up with some of these comments in the web chat, hopefully to see you all next week um, or some of you next week, because I, I completely agree that there are different context aspects, but having everyone agreed upon, and how do we actually figure out, um, get at these in a meaningful way, I think is really important. So I know we're, we're rounding up here. I'll just mention what we can, you can see here is just very briefly, some different statistics for um, evaluators are in the darker and principal investigators are in the lighter boxes here. You can see that there's pretty much a good agreement about the extent to which, um, Evaluators and PIs believe their projects agree or engage in um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as you can see, for diversity, they're in, in pretty good agreement. For equity, there's a bit of disagreement between um, evaluators and um, principal investigators, with evaluators saying that um, uh, there's their projects are engaging in equity to a lesser extent. And then, of course, inclusion, as you can see, Pretty good agreement there. And I see that we have some some questions coming in. So 
instead of maybe asking this chat, Tiffany, I don't know, what are your thoughts? Should we answer a couple of questions before we head over to our conclusions? Okay. Let's see, some of these have been tagged. Yes, are there recommended demographic questions, items that include inclusive language? Um, yeah, I think there's been a lot of discussion on this. Even if you look at um, uh, questions from N N NSF, I have had participants who are um, from a Latinx or Hispanic background tell me that they don't like, that they have to, that there is no, um, so when you fill out demographic questions for the National Science Foundation, you can say, are you Hispanic? Yes or no. But then when it gets down to your race, there is no Hispanic option. So they have to click, you know, white or black, but they may not identify that way. And so I think there's, there are quite a few articles that talk about this, um, which I think is, is quite interesting and something for us to really be thoughtful about. And, 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 and it gets to inclusivity just in the way that we ask simple questions about um, how people, their demographics. Also, this uh, issues of gender identity, right? Um, and, and how you ask questions and, and if you're forcing people into certain responses versus making uh, multiple responses. So I also agree that this is really important for us to think about. Maybe we will hop over to our conclusions as we're kind of wrapping up because I think we will have lots of time um, in, in the web chat next week. And we're also happy to receive um, emails and, and lots of follow-up. Um, Mary, thanks so much for sharing um, that link and we'll have that captured as well to send out to everyone. So just a couple of concluding thoughts. Diversity traditionally is what gets measured. It's easy to measure. Um, phenotypically, some, some traits are easier to see than others, right? And so one of the things that we really need to think about is how can we make sure that we're spotlighting or engaging with issues of equity and inclusion? A lot of people will say, oh yeah, we do DEI, we do EDI, but really what they're talking about is diversity. And research has shown that, you know, if you really are, if you're a project and you're really thoughtful about diversity, and let's say you bring in all different types of people who aren't traditionally in these contexts, it's also, it's actually more harmful to them and ultimately to your overarching goals if you're not actually thinking about equity and inclusion, right? Um, we need to think about how we can build capacity for focusing and measuring on equitable and inclusive practices in our programming. Oops. And it really is important to engage with DEI formally and informally. We didn't really get a chance to dive into this, but um, some of my previous research has shown that, that evaluators are, are more comfortable or better able to engage with DEI when they also are able to do it informally, right? Which makes sense. If you never talk about issues of race or diversity or any of, um, or racism or white supremacy, if you never talk about that informally, then it's gonna be really hard to engage with that topic formally. And so informally that, 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 that includes, you know, in meetings when, when you experience like microaggressions um, that you actually bring it up right in the meeting as, as the evaluator, the program op manager or grant administrator, that you're actually comfortable engaging with these topics informally. And um, let's see here, I'm gonna go ahead and let uh, Tiffany, I'm gonna just skip this and let Tiffany hop over to her final thoughts. Yeah, so um, in terms of just thinking about reflective practice, we're gonna revisit reflective practice just to end out our conversation today. I want This isn't a chat question per se, but I think it's important for us to uh, consider how we can further integrate um, purposeful Time. reflection activities to understand the incorporation of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our program's efforts. Um, and so I can't see, I wonder if I can move this, I can't, okay. Um, and so I really want us to think about the fact that reflective practice is necessary for both evaluators and stakeholders of these programs. Um, and in particular, that informal and formal engagement goes right back to the fact that when we when we operationally define diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're operation we're trying to operationally define social justice in some ways, and it doesn't do the job because words are imperfect mechanisms, right? We have to take those words and do things with them, and that takes really, really being willing to take action on social justice issues, measuring, talking about, reporting and having critical conversations with our stakeholders. Um, that means that we need to uh, think about the fact that measures are only as descriptive 
as the activity that they're designed to focus on. Uh, you, you, if you don't know what the activities are that you're trying to measure, it's going to be like missing the mark potentially. Um, if you if you uh, try to impose a measure without knowing what's going on. And so really thinking about what activities uh, your programs are engaged in uh, that can contribute to your own measurement of diver diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and outcomes, right? So process and product. All right. I know we could probably spend um, hours and hours talking about this. I'm not sure if my camera, oh, here we go. Um, and so really, again, we hope that you'll you'll join us next week for um, the web chat. And we'll also be looking forward to following up with you and engaging with you um, via email. Also, both Tiffany and I are both on Twitter, so happy to engage um, and, and communicate that way as well. So thank you all so much for your time. Let me just see here. Thank yep, the web you. chat is on Tuesday on the 25th. And I don't know if, uh, Emma, do you have, do you want to take these last few slides? Yeah, absolutely. So yes, thank you again. Um, again, the web chat is open for registration on the website. Um, anyone who attended today also will be receiving the link to the recording of this uh, great webinar in addition to the slides. And also we have a handout that goes over those different elements that Tiffany and Aisha talked about, about measuring equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, so if you haven't already, please go ahead and take our post webinar survey to go ahead and give us some feedback. Um, you should see the box there in the bottom corner on your screen. Thank you so much to Dr. Aisha Boyce and Dr. Tiffany Smith for joining us today and providing such good insight on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And thank you all for joining us. Um, again, pop over to the Evaluate website um, and join us for the web chat next week or uh, send us an email if you have additional questions. Uh, thank you again and have a great day.